Okay, thanks Michael and good evening gentlemen. The overview that I'm giving is of cybercrime and the Smart Nation and as you are all aware, there's a Smart Nation initiative that we are living in in Singapore and this, somebody asked just now, is this an actual place? Yes, we are living in it, our virtual Singapore. I have to do a bit of a word from our sponsors <laughs> where I'm from. The first one is the Center of Excellence for National Security, which is a research think tank. Mm -hmm. And we do research for NSCS, the National Security Coordination Secretariat, and CSA, the Cyber Security Agency. I'm also representing the Internet Society Singapore chapter, which is the non-government organization dedicated to ensuring the internet stays open and transparent. And that's in that respect, that's why we are providing this education. So two educational backdrops. The Center of Excellence for National Security has four parts which look at all these aspects, radicalization, social resilience, homeland defense, and my department which is the cyber security section. And so we do policy research and advice on these topics. As for the Internet Society, we are part of the Global Internet Society organization and what we do is we have certain priorities right now, of which cyber security you can see is a big one. And for this, we have done a number of things in Singapore. We have run workshops, public consultations, and we also do opinions and commentaries to the press and to the media to create better awareness of these topics. So, advertisement over. <laughs> what is cybercrime? Anybody from Interpol here? No. This is the familiar Interpol definition. Cybercrime, just so that we are talking about the same thing, two kinds. It's advanced cybercrime, which is the crimes against the computer. So here we have the unauthorized access. It fits nicely into the CIA in framework that we talk about, cybersecurity always, right? Confidentiality, integrity, and access. So. In terms of Singapore laws, the Computer Misuse Act makes it illegal to have unauthorized access. That's the confidentiality. You breach confidentiality by reading somebody's things. By protect the integrity against unauthorized alteration. And make sure that you have access to the resources by making it illegal to have unauthorized blocking either by DDoS or ransomware. So we already have a framework that is able to deal with this. And then there's also what we know as cyber enabled crime crime using the computer, which are all of these child porn, sextortion, spear phishing, terrorism, which you're also dealing with. So these are the two things we're talking about. And then we have a smart nation. So you will probably be familiar that this was launched, and there are several areas we're looking at. Transport is one. So you see the vehicles. Our transport system is going to be enabled to provide data back and also with autonomous vehicles. Healthcare, where the certain hospitals are making their records available and also the healthcare robots are also available in the hospitals. E-government, where government is making open data available so that data can be accessed by ordinary citizens to, with APIs so that you can create applications that can help the citizens. Green living and uh, the Yuhua estate was designed using a lot of internet modeling, computer modeling to improve the environmental footprint. And the last one, aged care, where because of our elderly population, uh, a lot of smart homes are being set up in order to help us care for the aged. And the milestones, just to remind everybody, it wasn't that long ago, it was just two years ago that it was launched by the PM. But since then, we've had the launch of the JTC Launchpad and Bash. And also in the middle of last year, the Changi General Hospital project. Also, 20 million has been given out by MDA. And Yihua Estate, the HDB Estate, is a smart Yihua has been launched. So the My Smart Home project actually starts in April 2016 in the Yihua Estate. 
and autonomous vehicles just a few months ago, testing on our roads. And some of you are already smiling. Yeah, wonderful thing, right? Autonomous vehicles. So some statistics to put in perspective, 9,000 smart homes in Yuhua State, where you can everything in your home can be smart, of which 3,200 households have elderly monitoring systems, so you can keep an eye on granny or grandpa, make sure that if they've fallen, you'll be able to help them get up. And 18,000 accounts or people who have registered on the Health Hub portal so that all their health records are accessible. This is wonderful. These are services available to everybody. Aged healthcare in the home, very important. There aren't enough homes for the aged, for all the aged to be in, nor do we want all our old folks to be in an old folks home. If they can stay, if they can be independent, isn't that great with technology to help them? So this is all good news. So what's the problem? And in this room, we are already aware of this. Just an example, not counting Shodan, where you can find more. Just one Russian website alone, you can find 73,011 security <laughs> cameras streaming live right, from the home. I wonder how many of the 3,200 elderly care monitors in Singapore are on this Russian website. Where you can see where granny can now be seen from Uzbekistan. Symantec alone announced that it had stopped five million ransomware, locky ransomware emails, and that's just locky ransomware. We don't count crypto locker. We don't count the other ransomware as of February 2016. Right? That's just one company, one ransomware. And as we have been seeing over the past couple of years at the various DEF CON conferences, autonomous vehicles. Isn't it great? Something that could help to alleviate our traffic situation in Singapore. Of course, you can. the best way to take care of traffic is take it off the road. <laughs> and because of the Jeep hacks, it was demonstrated you can hack into a Jeep Cherokee. Jeep uh, had to upgrade the security on 1.4 million cars. That's just one manufacturer. We know of another eight models of cars that are easily hacked. And just the other day, I discovered that my car can, Bluetooth can recognize my wife's phone from one football field away. Because I was sitting in the car and then suddenly, beep, her phone connects to the Bluetooth. <laughs> Which is really, really, you really realize how wide your threat surface is. So, IoT, wonderful thing. Available to all, hackable by many and also usable as devices to attack other people. Crab security, a researcher was the first one to get attacked by a massive IoT DDoS, followed by the DIN DNS attack. Somewhere between 16,000 to 300,000, uh, different numbers I've, been, I've heard, IoT devices used to attack the DNS and bring down half of the internet. And then, of course, sitting here in Singapore thinking that, oh, that's, only, that's okay, that only happens in big countries. Starhub, our very own DDoS. So what do we know about Starhub? Not much yet. What about our circle line? The trains that keep on breaking down with no explanation. All makes us wonder, why is the Internet of Things creating an Internet of Threats? Sorry for the bad grammar, I think I... Well, HP just took a survey of 10 smart devices and found 250 security flaws. Simple math says that's 25 flaws per device on average. Why are devices so flawed? We have the old framework of people, process and technology. The people problem, most people do not change their passwords or use a weak password especially on something as basic as a security camera. They don't think about change. Or your fridge. How many of you have changed the password on your fridge? Or your smart TV? Process-wise, there are IoT security standards. IETF, has, for example, has produced them. But it's not compulsory. It's not regulated. And technology-wise, IoT devices anyway are built to reach market fast. 
They're built for small size, they're built to have cool features, but they're not necessarily designed for security. So, we know this. You can have cheap, fast and secure. You can have choose any two of the above. <laughs> Usually, manufacturers will choose one and two because customers are only looking at one and two. So from a policy perspective, we know that if we could catch these people who are actually doing these things, there are laws against it. What about prevention? What is the government going to do about it? If you had noticed, the Singapore Cybersecurity Strategy, which was launched last month, has four pillars. The second pillar is very important. The first pillar says, strengthen the resilience of our critical information infrastructure. So the IT related to our critical infrastructure, our transport, <coughs> healthcare, energy sector, there's going to be resources put into that. The regulators are going to make sure that those people take care of it. But what about everybody else in Singapore? What about all the other businesses and sectors which are not critical infrastructure, but it's where everybody else is? The strategy is to mobilize businesses and community to counter cyber threats and cyber crime. If you understand what this sentence means, what is the government going to do about it? The verb is mobilize which means who is going to take care of cybercrime? Businesses and community. If you would like to know who businesses and community is, please look around the room. It's up to us. So the Cybersecurity Act is coming in 2017. It's slated to go to first reading in Parliament in July 2017 to be passed by either by end of 2017 or early 2018. And then it will take some time to actually come into force. The companies will be given time to get themselves up to speed. In the meantime, consultation is already open, not on a public field, but to organizations like HTCIA. And so the ministry is actually open to getting input from organizations like HTCIA to what you think is important to put into a Cybersecurity Act. So I'd encourage you to get inputs yourselves, your colleagues, your clients, uh, things that you feel should be in the new Act that will be able to help the whole group. So I was asked to set the stage. Um, as I understand from Interpol list, this is for some of the things that you are doing and some of the things that you're going to hear from my fellow panelists. So the best expertise to learn from is from the next two panelists. <laughs> so I hand it over to them. Is it me next? Yeah. Yeah. Hi everyone. So what all I can say is that he's basically taken all of the punchlines and the numbers I was going to use in presentation. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the introductions. I'm Jim Kent, um, work at Newix. How many of you are Newix people, users heard of Newix? Hey, thanks guys, <laughs> love this support. Okay, so, um, so it's just really so I got a gauge. Um, it was interesting because I said, hey, can you come here for 10 minutes and talk about technology and solutions <laughs> on the internet of things? Now, in reality, you know as well as I do, each one of those subjects is probably a day long session, if you're lucky. So in 10 minutes, what can I say? Um, well, there's a couple of ways we can do this without recycling these things. We are in an interconnected world. Doesn't matter what we say or what we do, whether we like it or not, we're in the middle of it. That's a fact. What does that really mean? Look at the numbers, to quote numbers. 50 billion devices, they say, by 2020 will be in the IOT. Every single one of them opens a surface. I have a house that had four windows, two doors. That was my threat surface. Now I have 50 billion of them that allow access. How do I make sure they're all locked? How do I make sure they're all secure? How do I make sure they're all made of the right standard glass? So on and so forth. And you can run that across to the world we live in. 
But you know, what does it mean? I've got one of these on, I'm sure we all have. The fact is that it's not that we just have to secure a watch, right? It's the fact we've got to secure the variety of watches. It's the fact that each one of those watches has its own firmware, hardware and code. And when we always go back to the software code chain, it's like, okay, so where's my weakness? Who actually sits and writes code properly anymore for these things? Not many. I think we probably assemble code, right? We all go and we get a bit of code from the website here and then, you know, so we assemble it to do certain things. Each one of those has an inherent flaw in them because they're coders. They're written, they're distributed, people maintain them. So when you start looking at it exponentially as to how much risk, your attack surface is huge. Yeah? And that's, that's basically what we need to understand. It's the age-old argument we've always had, and that is functionality versus security. Ever since day one, and it's not changed. And I love this because there's a lot of scaremongering that goes out about the internet of things, and don't be scared. Because actually, when you always take it back to fundamental basics, it's always the same. So I could take this conversation a couple of ways. Yes, there's basic things like, what do we need to do to secure things, and what is the technology? The technology is fantastic. We know the breaches there, like you said, the DNS, the DIN breach, that's great. The one that didn't really hit that much news, I don't know if it did over here, was the OVH French breach. Same software, same fired up the cameras, same fired up the DVRs, and hit and did a DDoS. But because it was a little French service provider, who cared? Yeah, suddenly half of the Eastern sort of waterboard in the US can't get on Netflix and the whole world comes to an end. <laughs> yeah, so suddenly it becomes real. It becomes real. Now, did you, have you seen in the press about the Liberia thing that's happened? So the country's been taken down now by the same thing. Country. So, call me a betting man, okay? I would say that somebody is testing the water oh, yeah. to mm. something else that's coming. The fact is that that West African country has one cable to the internet that goes through, to the, through the sea, it basically comes into the country, and it disables an entire country. So we're testing what's happening, and that's where it's coming. So whilst there is a lot of scaremongering, just be mindful that there is a lot more behind it. So when you actually look at it, you're right. We talked about the basic things of the securing passwords. I mean, because there was a very simple, from the old days when I used to talk about zombies and masters, and I actually, when I was, I was a police officer myself, many years ago, hence the grey hairs, I was a detective for 15 years, and I worked with the organised crime agency in the UK. I was investigating the Russian bot mm -hmm. right? There's even a book on it, actually, where I may have been, or may not have been mentioned in one of the books written by one of the soccer guys investigating these botnets. And I chuckled to myself because the code that was written that's been out there actually was not dissimilar. It used to go, scour, find a device, go, okay, I have a list of username and passwords that are just standard. Can I get in? Oh, I can. Thank you very much. I just drop that on here, send home a command and control, and move on to my next one. It actually isn't very clever. Once again, we're going back to basics. 15 years ago. It's the same thing. And slowly by slowly, we have built up the structure to secure things. And we're going to go through the same pain here. You mentioned who was securing this up. So OWASP, I don't know if any of you have looked at the OWASP website. They've got a really good program that everyone can get involved in about how to start securing this down. Because, of course, you've got all these vendors that are building everything in their own way, with their own code, doing their own thing. There's no uniformity. There's no regulatory body that says, this is how you have to build these things, these are the protocols for testing, these are how you secure from the ground up before you even release it to the public. So that's problem number one. They're not having to embed or have this OWASP testing or application testing at base before it even gets up there. You know, let alone before you start implementing, which is the next set of issues that come around it. So you could compound these up. And we can talk about the technology area as much as you like. Solutions, yes, change of passwords, get rid of universal plug and play, of course. All of the boring things, make sure you've got your patches done. Like I said, you can go back 15 years and smile about it because this is exactly what was written 15 years ago when all of these things came to play. Yeah. So there's some interesting things. Now, from a forensics perspective, which I'm hoping, I'm guessing that your investigators, hence the... Uh, 
the chapter and from a forensic background. I would also love to know, maybe we could talk about it after, after my section, on how any of you have had to capture devices or forensically investigate devices or if that's even hit on the radar or if anyone's had any thoughts on it. Um, because I was chatting earlier, was talking about, well, how do I even work out what's happened on my fridge? We talk about fridge. I have to chuckle because I actually saw an IoT toilet roll holder <laughs> that tells you that you're running. Now, if mm. I'm sat on the toilet and I've run out of toilet paper and I've had an app which is telling me you've run out of toilet paper, <laughs> I have got bigger <laughs> issues <laughs> on my hands, well, hopefully not my hands, I've got bigger issues to deal with than that telling me. So you have to work it through you know, as we go through and look at it. But how do I even think or consider the steps I need to go through to take the forensic data from a toilet roll holder? Because it's got an IP address. It's talking. I can arm that up to suddenly make requests. But if it gets, you know, uh, compromised, yep, yeah, I'm going to go to the government and make a request. But actually, I'm going to make three million requests as quickly as I can, along with <coughs> my phone, my watches, mm. everything else. And the ratio is something like there's one to seven now of human beings that have internet devices if you connect around your home. With people that have, the ratio is going ridiculous. So if I think now, yes, I've got Alexa, Hasn't anyone ever thought, when you go, Alexa, and it wakes up, that thing's permanently listening to us. Yes. No one actually cottoned on to that yet. It's like, cool, look at it, just did. No, 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 it's listening to everything. If I were out to compromise and I could compromise them, wow. You know, wow, what could you get in the world? Because then it doubles back, right? It's in, it's into my phone, it's got my Spotify linked up, <laughs> it's into my system via Spotify, which isn't, you know, inherently sound when it's on an iPhone. It's into my phone with my messages, you know, make my phone make a request. So there's all of these considerations that we have to take place. How do I get forensic data from Alexa? Where does that data reside? Amazon. Does it? And where does the AWS Cloud Instant reside physically? Yeah, 15 Right, so there's all of these things which is actually far more exciting in, in my tiny mind than talking about, you know, the things that we, it's like, this is real, because basically, if you had, those of you who want to write a white paper, and I'm done with writing white papers, I've thrown my life now on documents, but think about it, discuss it. Okay, here's a scenario, house has been breached, we found something has gone here, because it may work both ways. There may be a counter-terrorist cell in the house that has had Alexa compromised, and guess what? All the evidence has been recorded on Alexa of these people compiling to go and do a terrorist attack. So think about it every single way. Think very laterally. When I started my forensics career in the early 90s, I was presented with a NetApp server. There's data on here. Okay, there's my keyboard, my mouse, and my screen. No, there's data on here, and that was it. What do you do? Yes, technologies evolve, they grow, they allow access, they get you in and out. And that's where we're going to go again. But it needs provoking. And you know, you should be doing the same attack here. You should be mimicking those attacks, and I'm sure you are. OK, the hospital has been compromised. What does that mean? How do I get my evidential trail of the hospital? I mean, I dread to think of these insulin injections and these pacemakers that control the smart unit. And someone compromises me through a watch, which suddenly allows me to inject myself full of insulin and kill myself. Or sends my heart pacemaker, kills me. Because, you know, if we want to go scaremongering, that's as far as we could go. There really is an implication of life and death. So we need to start working out how do we respond and how does technology allow us to, one, watch the watchers? Because that's something that we've got to think about. Having something that could at least tell you or allow you to replay your IoT in a house if something happened is actually quite invaluable, for good and bad, yeah, to find out. So what is happening? What are people typing? What am I asking Alexa? Now, how are those things collected and how do we aggregate them? How do we bring them together? And how do we start telling a story about what's happened around that situation? So there's some of the technical aspects that I know I haven't really given you any answers, and I haven't got them, because actually if I had the answers of how to secure the internet things, I probably wouldn't be standing in the room right now. I'd be flying around with Richard Branson on his space thing. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a massive journey. That's all I can say. It's 20 years in the making of where we were, and we refreshed it and started all over again. 
new technologies, fighting for which is the best technology before one or two win. We haven't got any merging or blended technology yet. That will come because people will blend as you, we end up with only one set of watches and all the others will fade away, you know, bar for the hardcore people who will keep the vulnerable watches on. But, you know, they're the different things we need to look at in life. So I only had 10 minutes and it was really just to give you that. If you want to go any deeper with anything, love to do that. But I want to provoke those thoughts and if we have a Q&A at the end, happily go through them a bit deeper. Okay, thank you for your 10 minutes. Appreciate it. Thank you. You've done slides, haven't you? <laughs> no.